there are secrets out there, guys, performance marketing secrets, and knowing just one or two of them can light up your funnels. Let's go. This is Performance Marketing Insiders. I'm Chris Mechanic. Join me as we go deep into the secrets of the world's elite marketing minds. Performance Marketing Insiders is sponsored by Web Mechanics, the AI-driven performance agency that makes you smarter. Welcome to another exciting episode of Performance Marketing Insiders. I'm super duper excited to have our guest here today. He's actually one of my close personal friends. I've known him for many years. But this guy is a is a marketer and advertiser. He's, he describes himself as an ad tech guy. He'll say he doesn't know anything about marketing, but he really does. Um, but an ad tech guy, he absolutely is. He came up through the ranks uh, at Videology, which has been acquired by Inmobi. He was a big shot at Jellyfish uh, up until recently when he was plucked by, uh, by within a different agency, who's super duper lucky to have you. Um, Welcome to the show, Alex Kukic. How are you, man? I'm Chris. Oh, Chris, I'm doing great. Um, high, high billing to live up to there. I don't know if that's uh, exactly what we agreed to ahead of time as a discussion and uh, the talking points, but it's good to be here, man. I always enjoy sitting down and, and rapping with you, and uh, thanks for all those kind words. I'm doing well. What's going on? Well, I meant every word of it, dude. I learn something from you every time we talk about all different types of topics, um, not just ads and marketing. Awesome. But Thank you me. know how we roll here. We're all about secrets. Let's start off by you telling us one of your juiciest secrets. Uh, well, I know today we're going to touch a little bit on kind of the future of advertising and the cookie-based world. And I think the biggest secret out there is nobody really knows. Um, people that are on the inside and think they know, um, you know, they only kind of have inklings of what they're building and where they think they need to head. Um, and I think that's a really interesting, you know, kind of secret that's in the marketplace is nobody really knowing about where cookie-less advertising is, is going. And the reason I, I mention that is, you know, I have a huge player in the space in Google, um, and they've gone through three, some could argue four iterations of what their next solution is going to be when it comes to this stuff. Um, and, the no and the next piece of news that you get is it's delayed. Nope, we got to reiterate. We got to move forward. And then you hear... You know, all the non-Google folks, right? The SSPs, the trade desks of the world, the Epsilons, all the data companies, and they're building something and they think they have a good solution. But until Google pushes that button, they don't really need their solution. And oh, I, I so think you're saying really not even Google knows. I thought you meant like the average brand or the average advertiser, but you're saying Google doesn't even know. I mean, I think just to put a blanket on everybody, there might be about seven or eight people that are sitting inside of the walls of Google and think they're really onto something. And now they got to figure out how they can commercialize it and expand it out globally. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I think generally, you know, everybody's kind of looking at Google for what's going to come next. You know, it was Ads Data Hub and then it was Flock and then it was Topics. And that was supposed to happen right now. Like, you know, two years ago, we heard, you know, fall 2022, it's over. Right. And, and in July, we heard, eh, maybe it's over later, right? So I, I really think that a lot of folks just don't quite know. And again, the other part that's hard about this is if you're building an alternative cookie-less solution, it's not going to matter until Google, who has the biggest user ID network on the planet, actually shuts that down because their solution that you're still able to use is probably going to be better than whatever your alternative is that you're building to that. So I think it's a really interesting proposition. So. For the folks that may not be, you know, that uh, up to speed or that in tune with this particular topic, can you explain, like, like, could you just kind of shell it up for us, like we're fifth graders basically, and just say, like, like what does it mean this cookieless world? What will it affect? Why does it matter? Why is it so hard? Sure. So it's it's all really just about. I know that was like five questions in one. <laughs> yeah, it's we'll, we'll we'll chop it up as best we can. So it, it's really just comes down to what is called interest-based advertising. And at the crux of this cookie issue uh, is user privacy. So if you've been on the internet, like pretty much every person in you know the modern world in the last couple of years, you see this little bar that pops up at every website that you go to, accept all cookies or deny all cookies. That just means that you're you know opting in to let people know that you visited that website. And whatever interests, you know, a company visiting that website are appended to your profile. That's what basically makes, you know, the internet free. Because as a publisher, which is a website, 
Uh, I can then see that, you know, you've gone and shopped for a car. Um, you've also looked at new floor mats um, and you've also looked at golf clubs. So if I'm Callaway, I want to serve you an ad on the website that I'm at because I think you might buy my golf clubs or I'm Ford and I know you're in the market for a pickup truck. Um, and those cookies that follow you along on the articles that you're reading in the website that you've been help build that profile that makes you appealing to advertisers, which is why you can roam the web for free. Um, because they have a profile that they can sell to advertisers and make money off of. And if they don't, they got to make money off you some other way um, because, you know, they're, they're not charities. Uh, so that's so, interest based advertising and cookies in a nutshell, I guess. So then Ford would then buy the, so how does Ford get access to that data? They yeah. So, from- you know, uh, uh, any number of, you know, first and third party data providers, right. Uh, Ford's going to always want to know, you know, who's pulling, Carfax on pickup trucks. And, you know, I'm sure Carfax is willing to turn around and sell that to Ford's agency so that they can build a, you know, a first party data profile or third party data profile on those folks. And then other folks that just, you know, log on to Auto Trader um, or, you know, Auto Magazine and just look five best pickups of 2023. And Ford's in the business of selling pickups. And if I'm reading about the best pickups for 2023, it's probably time to whack Alex over the head with a gnat. Um, and that is all just set through, as you know, campaign management within platforms and interest-based targeting, right? Auto and tender, you know, household income in this, you know, part geo of the world so that, you know, I'm not getting an advertisement here in Maryland for John Elway's Manhattan Beach Toyota, um, you know, or his Manhattan Beach Ford. I'm getting it for, you know, Bob Bell in Maryland or Dar Cars or whatever the, you know, um, specific regional or hyper localized advertiser would be. Um, yeah. and then Ford, you know, at a higher level, um, you know, we could go deep into auto advertising. There's tier one, which is Ford commercial we see on Sunday. There's tier two, which is the regional auto dealers. And then there's tier three, which is the specific auto dealer that I might be able to go to within a five minute drive. Uh, and Ford has an interest in all those advertisers, all those, all those buckets working well so that they can continue to stave off Toyota Nissan, Infinity, um, and the like, um, and that's that's really it. And yeah. I've probably already gone too far down the rabbit hole. <laughs> well, Ford. So Ford certainly wouldn't like it if third-party cookies went away. Yeah, uh, no, not at all. And, and I could see probably the first and third-party data, like Carfax, wouldn't like it. The third-party data providers wouldn't like it. But why is it so hard for Google? Like, what are this? What's at stake for Google? Like, suppose that they launch the wrong solution. Like, why are they thinking yeah, I mean, so hard about it? So I, I think the first part is what is the, the first question is what is the motivation of Google to do this? And I think at a very elementary level, it's to stay off Capitol Hill. It's to avoid antitrust litigation. If they can avoid that, they can protect profits, they can protect shareholders, they can continue to you know advance themselves as one of the you know biggest and best technology companies in the history of you know our modern world, right? Mm-hmm. So that's that's what the motivation is, right? And what's at stake for them is is profits, right? If they are no longer, you know, the best, most privacy centric and safe place to go for advertisers to spend their money, then advertisers are going to be very interested in what alternative solutions look like. Um, and so that really just comes down to you know share of wallet um, and profitability um, and things of that nature. So that's 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 what's you know at stake. If they were to roll it out wrong, they could run into a boatload of privacy violations, not here just in the US or in California, but what you have with you know European sanctions as far as GDPR and all of those things. So if they, they make a mistake, you know, they could, you know, unintentionally expose a lot of personally identifiable information, which is exactly what they're looking not to do. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to how you bucket people into to certain things, um, like a health category, right? Well, what does that mean? Am I a diabetic looking for a new medicine? Am I a new dad whose kid is coughing at three months old and I have no idea what to do when I search health and I'm in a health bucket? Um, I think they really, you know, what's at stake for them is if their re-engineering of cookies isn't targetable as specifically as cookies can be in a privacy compliant way, then advertisers are just going to go somewhere else. And, you know, there there seems to be a pretty good groundswell of somewhere else at the moment. Fascinating. I'm tempted to go deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole, but um, but let's let's move on. Just one last thing on cookies, or maybe two. I don't know. But uh, so 
what are some so it sounds like it sounds like they google felt that they were onto something so they announced a date they were like we got it guys we just got to fine tune it so like let's put a date on it and let's make it happen do you know what that thing was or like how would you describe that thing versus like what the and why it didn't work versus like what the real solution would look like yeah so i i think it's really you know what they're trying to do is they're trying to bucket people into categories um that they fit in right so you know i play golf you play golf we're in the golf bucket i ski you surf i'm in the ski bucket you're in the surf bucket right um but what does it mean when the buckets become you know health or auto am i just a guy who travels for business and i need a car rental well if I'm enterprise and I need a car rental, that's really good to know, right? But if I'm just in this auto bucket, then you know Ford's serving me ads for things that I don't really need because I don't need to buy that F-150. I just need to you know, rent a car when I'm going on my ski trip when I get to Denver. And I think trying to bucket those things in a broad enough but specific enough capacity is really what ultimately is the holdup and the hangup. Um, because then when you get into other things that are a little bit more sensitive than skiing, golfing, or buying a car, you know, around, you know, pharmaceuticals, for example, America is one of two countries in the planet that allows advertising for pharmaceuticals. Um, you know, and you can just watch basically any major sporting event that's going on right now. And you can see where the money's coming from behind those ads. Um, and to make a mistake there would mean that they're missing out on advertising dollars and potentially are doing so in a non-privacy compliant fashion. And they just don't want to do that. Right. So I think those are some of the things there is how can we get specific, but still keep it anonymous, but we're getting the right people in those buckets that we're creating. I think that's really what we're, we're trying to get to. And I, I don't think they've quite figured that out as well as they'd like to. Um, because again, you got to remember that not only is Google, you know, a huge advertising power on the demand side, a demand side example is Ford looking for me to buy that F-150, but they own the largest supply side network in the world um, which are the publishers of those websites, right? You know, the tool to get yourself in Google's ad network is called Google Ads Manager. That's free, free for you to use. Um, and almost every publisher out there has either gotten started with that or is still on that platform in some way, shape, or form because it ties them immediately to ad dollars that give them revenue to run that business. Um, so, you know, there's a there are two sides to that equation for Google, and I think that they're trying to figure that out. And again, everybody else is kind of on pins and needles because they're benefiting from Google withholding, you know, that next step. And I think, you know, they, they got a little ahead of their skis because once they started to put this stuff in a sandbox and let people really go in and test it in a development environment, then they started to realize that we're maybe a, a few more holes than they would like to have before they push this thing out. And, you know, remember, Google is a global business. They're, they're not just, you know, a, a, an American-based business. They're in pretty much every country in the world where there's, aver or excuse me, where there's internet. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating. So last thing on cookies, what, sure. what's your best guess? Like what's your prediction? What do you think will happen? So I think what the trade desk is doing is pretty interesting. Um, because if you look who they've partnered with, they basically have the coalition of the willing, which I like to call it. So you got Everybody in there from big data companies like a live ramp and an Epsilon to SSPs like a Pubmatic and a Magnate um, to 33 across. You have the agency holding companies. You have huge publishers like the Washington Post and other groups that have a lot of information about all these different users. Um, and those are the same users that Google has information on. So the trade desk is, is kind of you know having a, a signed in internet, if you will. And this is an over... Um, this is an oversimplification, uh, but really through a system uh, which somebody way more equipped could explain to myself uh, through hashed emails. Basically, you go to a website and you provide your email and that kind of has your profile on in the background for you to access that content on that website uh, in a free capacity. Right now, if you're a paying customer for whatever it is that you're looking for, you know, you're kind of already subjecting yourself for them to use that information, how they see fit to help monetize the website, etc. But the reason why I think that's relevant is, you know, when this cookie list solution first came out, you had the agency hold codes, you know, Group M tried to build something called M Platform many, many moons ago, which was their unique user ID across the entire web. 
you know, Omnicom, the rest of these guys tried to do that. Live Ramp tried to do that with their coalition of publishers. Well, now you have agency hold codes, you have the publishers, you have the data companies, and you have the bigger DSPs. Sander is in there as well as the trade desk trying to come up with a solution um, that can be viable. So the thing that I think is most interesting is, you know, these guys coming together and, you know, putting their heads together and sharing information openly that can be then leveraged by everybody, not just the trade desk. You know, that's a rising tide that will lift all boats. And I'm interested to see where that will happen. Again, the hard part is, is that better than cookies? And I think, you know, the unequivocal answer is no. So it's really hard to understand how good that could be until that button to turn these things off and fully deprecate them is actually pressed. That seems like it would be like way more intrusive from a privacy perspective. Cause like if everything were like, if I logged in and there was a single profile where everything that I've ever done were tied to it, like while logged in, it seems a lot more personally identifiable, right? Then do, it's, but you have, but you have the option to not log in, right? Oh, in right. that example, you know what I mean? Um, and so that's where your personal trade-off comes at, right? Are you the person that then just, you know, goes to duck, duck, go. I mean, that's an option for you out there as well. And for, for folks that, that want it, you know, and that, that want to keep that privacy, you know, they have, they don't have the devices in their pockets that you and I have, right. They don't have that droid. They don't have, uh, that Apple product. They have something that most of us have never heard of. They're on a carrier that, you know, most of us are unfamiliar with, um, and they're using a, a, a browser like something like DuckDuckGo, which is you know very privacy specific. So it's not so much that it's more intrusive; it's just going to force those folks to go a different way to get their information, right? Because I don't I don't have to share that information if I don't want to, and I don't have to log in if I'd like to not. Um, it just depends on what that trade off is for that information for you know what I'm trying to gather. Yeah, crazy dude. Yeah, man, like this trade desk universal ID, dude. Like they got something going there, but yeah. how do they know if it works if they don't, if they're not forced to use it? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's like, oh, you're building as a publisher. I'm getting all this like cookie list demand that I can serve and I can make money against. But do I need that if I can still have the cookie demand? Right. I don't know. You know? Yeah. So it's, it's really fascinating, I think. And I think these delays are really. I think they're killing Google, man. I, I honestly do. Um, this is their fourth thing that they've tried and pulled back now. Dang. Four. Yeah. So That's crazy. And that next delay is, I think, dude, I think that next delay is until like 2024 or something. Dude, so then if Trade Desk does that, like if their uh, coalition takes off and becomes the thing, does that mean everybody has to go to Trade Desk to buy? No, dude. It's open source technology. That's why oh. Xander and those other DSPs are in there. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So it's just this okay. massive graph that yeah. like anybody yeah. can tap into. Yeah, that's my understanding of it at the moment. Um, but yeah, you know, because I think I think they themselves would then be in the same conundrum that Google's in if they only built it for themselves, right? Right, right. So but you think about that ad hold, you know, agency hold codes, the data providers, the world's biggest publishers, especially the U S based biggest publishers, plus the SSPs in there, you know, the Pubmatics of the world, the magnites of the world. Yeah. You, you probably have everybody that you have on the Google side of things. So it can work. Probably. I mean, and potentially even more, you would think, right? Yeah. Like you do you bring up bind up. Yeah. No, definitely more. But you bring up a good point. Like, am I really going to want to sign in for every web page that I'm on? I don't yeah. know. Me, I don't really care. Um, the thing that bothers me the most is like that my phone is always on and is always listening to me. That shit bugs the hell out of me. I wish they would turn that off before they worried about this cookie shit. But you yeah, know, that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> dude, I got an Alexa at my house. Oh, and dude. uh you know, it's, you're supposed to have to say Alexa to activate it, but I'll be talking sometimes and like this little yellow ring, that little yellow ring around the bottom, like lights up. I'm like, I did not say Alexa. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, why yeah. are you listening? Oh, uh, well, that scared the shit out of me when they were able to subpoena the Alexa records for somebody who had like a murder happen in their house. Like, you know, that thing was just always on. And it could have that whole thing on tape, like not like, you know, I'm murdering anybody inside the confines of my home or anything like that, but that's just 
different. You know what I mean? Crazy. How did you become such a badass? How, where, how do you like yeah. know all uh, this stuff? I don't know about that. I think it's just kind of keeping up with some people that are a whole lot smarter than me. Um, yeah. You know, I think also there are some really cool small companies that are finding some wins here. You know, 33 Across, which is a, a smaller SSP company, um, has some technology that's been of interest in some of the publications that I've been reading. Um, and then, you know, I, I still have friends at Google. I have friends at the trade desk. I have friends at the agency holding companies. And, you know, again, the, the big secret that we started with is, is nobody really knows. Um, so to yeah. those if hashing emails is the way, um, who knows if, if it's not, who knows if the privacy sandboxes that Google is going to continue to iterate on, uh, is the way, and who knows if they'll ever push go, if nobody really forces their hand, uh, a lot of unknowns, but, um, yeah, just talking to smart people like you is, I guess, where I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> what do you read like industry specific or who do you follow? Uh, Man, I mean, you know, I'm always reading, you know, the ad weeks. And I think, I think one thing that's a funny one is, is tech crunch. You can kind of go down a rabbit hole. Um, mm -hmm. you know, you can get in there and they'll take you to a different publication and you can kind of keep clicking and, and figure some, figuring some things out. Um, I'm always intrigued at what the bigger heads, you know, whether it's green at the trade desk or Sundar at Google, what kind of narrative they're pushing out. And if that, you know, how elementary that narrative is and, and what can kind of be cracked in it. Um, and then just, you know, also the other thing that I think is, is really intriguing. There's a lot of smart people that don't post a ton of stuff on LinkedIn that have never been quoted in articles. And it's interesting to follow those people along. Where have they been? You know, how much time did they spend on the agency side before they went back to technology? How much time were they on the technology side before they went to a MVPD, like a Comcast or an AT&T, right? Mm -hmm. What business is Comcast buying? What business are they doubling down on? What business is AT and T selling off? Right, things of of that nature. I think those are the macro trends that are kind of easier to follow. So always just staying in tune with who's being sold for what and where, and you know what other up and coming companies are doing and how quickly they're able to gain a market share is is kind of my answer to that. I don't think there's any one spot other than just following your friends around and making sure you stay in touch. That's awesome, dude. Cool, man. Well. Um... Let's talk a little bit about you. I'm curious about your, well, I know your background, but if you could, um, just for the, for the listeners, give like a brief sort of career trajectory, like how you landed where you are. And I'm curious about, um, sure. just like what's going on with you. Like what, what yeah. victories and triumphs are you seeing? What challenges are you having? Just like what's going on in your world? Sure. Absolutely. So um, I guess I've been in the advertising space for about 10 years now. I started at a company of videology. Uh, I was an account manager, managing publishers, buying inventory on Passback for $6 and trying to find an advertiser to buy it for, you know, seven or eight bucks or nine bucks, old ad network stuff, which is how this thing was built, as you know. Um, and then from there, I, you know, just moved into a couple of different new business development, you know, endeavors that we were taking on, you know, took a, a global project management role between videology and our relationship with Yahoo Japan. Yahoo is massive in Japan. You know, it wasn't more than six, seven years ago that they still owned a 85% market share of search in Japan and really just kind of, you know, being hit with problems and solving them. So I was fortunate enough to find a great mentor uh, and leader in Scott Ferber. Um, I sat directly next to Scott for two years and he was a huge help to me. Scott, you know, founded advertising.com and sold that to AOL in 2006. And he's just, you know, one of the smartest people that you'll ever meet, period. Uh -huh. And so, you know, working closely with Scott, seeing how he worked, seeing how he thought, and then helping him solve problems along the way was probably, you know, the, the best part of my career. Um, from there, you know, I, I never wanted to move to New York City. So, I jumped over um, in Baltimore and joined the company in Jellyfish, uh, which was a really great opportunity. They were reselling Google's technology on you know the demand side. So their DSP, their search ads, 360 product, their ad server, and their analytics platforms, and really just helped Jellyfish grow uh, into one of the larger resellers globally, managing a sales team and a technical account management team to drive really good growth and revenue. And, fortunate enough to go through a capital event there. And then, you know, within uh, came knocking on my door. I think Joe Yockwell, who's the CEO and founder of Within, is beyond a brilliant guy. Um, he, he's somebody who works harder and longer than anybody I've ever met. 
and just to join up with him and see how he worked was a great experience. And, you know, I'm winding my time down within now, uh, you know, for the folks at home, you and I are talking at the beginning of the last quarter of the year. And it's been a really good experience. Um, and I got two kids. So walking them to school every day is the coolest thing I do. Picking them up from school, having my daughter read to me at night, things like that are really cool. So I'm enjoying, you know, the opportunity to see what's next. Been doing some consulting here and there and having some conversations that are intriguing. And, um, you know, it's also been nice to take a little break. As you know, I was a guy who was on 80 to 100 flights a year for for years and years. And, you know, the pandemic um, has kind of come and gone now, but it's nice to have a, a, an opportunity to pick and choose, you know, where and, and how you want to get back into some things. So that's kind of where I'm at now. And uh, it's been good. It's been a good ride. I'm, I'm very thankful for all the folks that, you know, have, have been part of my journey. And for me, you know, the most motivating thing is putting people in a position to see, succeed that's best for them. And that lines up with, you know, the company's direction and their bottom line profitability and the mission that they have. If you can mirror that at junior level and senior level employees with the company as a whole, uh, you have some really happy people that want to come to work and do some really cool stuff and you can go pretty far together. And that's always the, always the guiding light in whatever I'm looking for next. Wow. That's an awesome career trajectory, man. You've had some amazing experiences sitting next to Scott Ferber for two years, like neck, like literally next to him. Yeah. Literally next to him. You know, it was, uh, you know, it was, I got lucky. Um, you know, I, wow. I feel very lucky and, um, yeah, it was great. It was a really good experience. And, uh, well, that's how you, know, you became such a badass. You had like three awesome experiences in a row. They were good. Yeah, they were, they were definitely good. And they were also different, right? Um, you know, I, I probably favor the technology side a little bit more um, than just the services side. You know, Jellyfish having the technology resale relationship with Google, Videology obviously having that first party technology relationship um, and being along for the ride and, you know, just seeing some of these things that were called out three, four or five years before they actually happened um, were really interesting. And I think those are the things that you'll probably always remember most. Well, that's awesome, man. You're a really impressive individual. I appreciate it. So are you. I'm, you know, it's it's nice of you to have me on here again for I think the second time. Um, but it's it's people like you that are doing all the things I talked about uh, in your own business. So it's uh, it's a pleasure to be a small snippet of that, uh, especially well, with all that you got going on. Well, thank you, dude. Thank you. Always a pleasure talking with you. Let's move over to the lightning round. I got a couple of quick closing questions for you. Let's go. If you were going to start a side hustle, what might that side hustle be? Oh, man. Um, probably drop shipping on Amazon. You know, <laughs> like if, if I'm totally honest, that's something you could just do 24 7, 365. And it's not that you don't have to work hard at it, but, you know, I don't see consumer habits changing anytime soon. So I think that's a business if you work on it. You know, a couple hours a day, every week, every month, every year for several years, you can have something that could be pretty stable for the long term, for sure. Interesting. Uh, most influential reads, like any book oh, man. that has just like totally changed the game for you? Yeah. Um, Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willick, um, mm, who's a Navy one. SEAL and just a total badass. Um, I hear about that all the time, but I've not read it. It's a really good one. Um, I think, you know, he's a little controversial, but I like uh, his idea. You know, Elon Musk says, try to do your 10 year plan at six months. Um, you'll probably get further than you would have any other way. I think that's just a nice little snippet. And then another, you know, read that I read every year is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I think that's just, that's a classic. I'm also have a bunch of real estate holdings as something that I'm passionate about. You know, that personally from our conversations. So that's just a, another good one um, to go through. And then uh, I also think like Miracle Morning is a good one. Um, and the one thing um, by Robert Keller, you know, from Keller Williams, um, mm -hmm. there's some really good nuggets in there. I think, I think I love the good. one thing I love. I think yeah. that's an underrated one. Yeah, it's cool. It's good. I, I have that queued up for my Mexico trip actually on Audible. So I'm excited for that again. Nice. And then last one is if you could go back to being 18 years old again and do something differently, what might that be? Oh, man. I, I wish you teased that one. I wish you teased that one out for me before we <laughs> jumped in. Um, 
I think my best piece of advice to myself at 18 would have been start a side hustle in college, whatever it is that you think is fun and you think might be able to make money or might not just do it to no end. Um, I think that would have been it. And the other thing that I would have said to myself is work as hard as you possibly can in your twenties. Uh, you have no liabilities. You have very minimal assets. You can be very selfish with your time. Um, unfortunately, I think the society that we're in uh, kind of flips that and says, you're in your 20s, you have as much freedom. You know, Go to Bali, take these vacations, You know, whatever it is. Uh, I think those are the things that I probably would have looked back on myself and wish that I had doubled down on. Uh, it's easier to say now because I also have <laughs> almost 20 years of, of what happened next. And some of those ideas, if I had stayed with and chased down, would have become pretty lucrative and they would have been pretty fun along the way. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean that, and then, you know, the other thing that I probably didn't even a piece of advice that I got when I was in my twenties, but I didn't really hang on to until I was 27 was never take a job for the money, take a job for the opportunity and the money will come. Um, mm -hmm. So anytime I'm talking to young people, I definitely try to share some of those pieces of wisdom because if I had been able to gobble that up, I think, you know, um, my life is in a pretty great spot. I'm a very happy person, but I, I think it could be, Somewhat better if uh, the 18 year old me had heard those things and lived by him a little bit sooner than 27 year old me. Yeah, I feel you, man. Well, those are really, really good answers, dude. So, finally, uh, for anybody that's listening, if you like this, please drop a like, a comment, share it with a friend. Uh, and, Alex, uh, where do people learn more about you? How can they find you online? Yeah, um, LinkedIn is, is probably the best place. And, um, you know, my email is always open, Alex Kukic at Gmail, if you want to slide in there for a quick chat. And, um, you know, thanks for the time, Chris. I really appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely, man. Anytime. You're welcome. Awesome. Thank I'll you. I'll talk to you later. We'll talk soon. Bye. And that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us today. For show notes and other episodes, visit us at performancemarketinginsiders.com. This podcast is sponsored by Web Mechanics, the performance agency that makes you smarter, offering AI-driven search, paid social, analytics, and conversion rate optimization for financial services, health, B2B, and SaaS brands that know. Hey guys, exclusive for listeners of this podcast, you can get a performance marketing assessment for free. And this isn't some cookie cutter automated report. It lays out detailed, specific things you can do right now to unlock limitless growth and nirvana level personal satisfaction. To claim your free assessment, just go to performancemarketinginsiders.com slash audit and you'll have your customer report within just a few days. 